Hey, Peace Hikers, this is Mr. Ray, and we are going to begin our last video in this series on research methods. So congratulations, you almost made it through. We are going to talk today about factors that can reduce our control in experimental designs and therefore reduce our internal validity. And then we'll talk about some things, some procedures we can do to reduce the likelihood that those flaws will affect our results. So hopefully you'll have your notes out and you'll be following along with the notes and taking good Cornell notes and remembering to include some personal reflection in those Cornell notes. So let's get started. We're going to talk about internal validity first. And internal validity of our test refers to the causal relationship in our experiment between the IV and the DV. So when we claim that with the experimental method we can conclude cause and effect, the more we control variables other than the IV, uh, the more likely we can say that our results are valid, that the test measured what it was supposed to measure, that the effect of the IV on the DV. It's kind of like taking a, a history test on World War II and if 90% of those questions were actually about World War I, we would say that the internal validity of that test was uh, pretty low, at least in relationship to your score, um, as far as it measures your knowledge of World War II. Basically, with internal validity, we're, we're confident that our manipulation of the IV actually caused a change in the DV because we controlled other variables, and we'll talk about how we can do that. So confidence means that we are absolutely sure, just like this guy right here, that our results are due to what we wanted to happen, or they're due to our manipulation of the IV and what we thought would happen. External validity, on the other hand, is another type of validity that's really important in our research, and it refers to how generalizable are our results from our sample to our target population. So we do a test on our sample, our baseline group, and how confident are we that we can take the results from that sample that was true for our sample, we got the results we did, but can we generalize those results and say, hey, if we did the same process on the target population, we might get the same results. So external validity is how generalizable are our results to the target population. We're going to talk briefly about biases here and what biases can do. Um, bias exists in all research, so it's hard to get rid of entirely, but there are some factors that we can, um, or at least some procedures we can do. So remember, the best designed experiments have bias. That's why we, we rarely say we proved something. That we can say we accorded it a certain level of support, maybe 95%. But remember, biases can lead to faulty results and low external validity. They, how can these biases be reduced? Well, first we need to take a look at the type of biases that exist, and then we'll talk about how we can maybe minimize or reduce those. So some of the more common biases, first off, we might start with sample bias, sometimes called selection bias, and this occurs at any time when a random sample is not used, because then the, the sample is not likely representative, if you remember that from our sampling video, and we want it to be representative of the population. An example of sample bias might be if we take the first 30 volunteers for a sample um, for our experimental group. And that may be because we asked a class if they'd like to participate or um, some other method like answering an ad in a paper or something like that. So when we use volunteers, we're likely to have sample bias. Demand characteristics are another factor that can cause a subtle bias in our research. This is also known as the Hawthorne effect, so make sure you can connect those two words together because you might see either on the AP test. This occurs when participants in research are trying extra hard to be good subjects and behave in a manner that helps the experimenter. Now, I often look for reversing the terms in AP Psychology maybe help us better understand that. So if we reverse those terms, we get characteristics demanded of us. So if the subjects have an idea of what's happening 
in our research. They might want to be a good guinea pig. You might see guinea pig effect in some uh, textbooks or articles. When parts of an experiment demand that we behave in a certain way, we often act like we think we're supposed to. And in research, we, we really want the subjects to act like they normally would act in that situation. I display guinea pig effect as a grad student in my wife's research in her experimental psych class for memory. They were testing memory and we had to watch items flash on a screen. There were 20 terms, I think, pictures, and we were supposed to remember them as best we could. And I knew what the test was about, so I used a mnemonic device, which I typically don't use, but to remember the terms and the words, and I got almost all of them right, which is way higher than average in there. Um, they're like, oh, wow, that's really great, even though I displayed demand characteristics and Hawthorne effects. So I was a good guinea pig, and uh, I displayed my superior subject effect. That's demand characteristics. Another bias is experimenter bias, and this occurs, you might guess, when the experimenter gets the results that he or she wanted to get. This is also called the Rosenthal effect. Um, David Rosenthal um, who, who kind of discovered or at least labeled this tendency, recently passed away. I saw his obit in one of my psych journals. Um, he basically said that it's quite possible for the experimenter to treat the subjects differently, which might lead to the results that the experimenter expects or wants. So we have to have really rigid safeguards in order to prevent this from happening. Um, one more example of a factor that could affect the outcome, uh, something you've probably all heard of, the placebo effect. And when our expectations about the effect that the IV should have on us actually has an influence on the DV, uh, independent of the actual effect of the IV. So what's affecting the DV is actually this other inert substance, and it's not even the IV, then that's kind of the placebo effect. For example, if we're in an experiment and you're 21 years old and you are legally able to drink beer and we're in an experiment where they're testing the effects of alcohol on reaction time or how about the effects of alcohol on sociability, how social are you, and you think you're drinking alcohol and that may cause you to act more socially maybe make people angry. But what if the drink you actually consumed was not even alcohol? It was an inert substance that you were told might be alcohol, and you acted more social anyway. Your social tendency, which is measured by the DV, um, was caused by a placebo effect, not by the alcohol in that drink. So uh, that would be an example of placebo effect. We might see it more in, in experiments with drugs and, and um, other substances like that, where a pain medicine, um, somebody thinks they're getting pain medicine and their headache goes away, even though they really were given a placebo, which is inert, which means it shouldn't cause an effect, but it sometimes does. Other factors that can affect results. These are big. These terms often pop up in the AP test. Extraneous variables or extra variables. These include any variable that we didn't intend to be in the research that might have an impact on the dependent variable. These are typically temporary in nature. It could be things like fatigue or how distracted you are on a given day. So if you're really tired and you go into an experiment, that might affect the results, even though we didn't consider um, fatigue to be something we wanted to test. So any variable other than the IV that causes a change in the DV um, is a, a extraneous variable. And this includes differences between the experimental and control group. So we have the experimental group here, and we're comparing it to the control group. And if there's differences between these two groups in skill level, attitudes, ability, fatigue, etc., that could affect the DV. These are typically brought in with the subject. It's kind of like extra luggage they carry in, and we can't control it all the time. So if you think of the subjects walk in and they have stuff that's kind of hidden, whether it be attitude or, or diet or things like that, are they worried about something, stress level? The solution here is random assignment. So if we, we have our, our representative sample and we randomly assign to experimental and control group 
we're likely to even out those extraneous variables. So there's somebody in the experimental group that may be a little bit extra tired today, but there's also likely to be somebody in the control group that's a little extra tired, somebody who's more motivated in each group, somebody who's less motivated in each group, and so on. Confounding variables. This is one of those term pairs that are often misconstrued. Think confounding variable is a built-in design flaw. So it's what the experimenter does when they make the experiment. They build it and put it together. I always consider that confounding variables is like a construction variable. We screwed up when we built this, uh, the experiment, and some of those screw-ups cause a difference in the dependent variable other than the IV. So something's happening, and the groups are just different. This can be where we test subjects, when we test subjects, how we test subjects, or how they're exposed to the independent variable or not. So how do we control these things? We're going to hit this fairly quickly. I know we're already about 11 minutes here, but how do we get more validity? Well, one of those ways is single blinding. Very important term. But wait a minute. Not that kind of single blinding. Single blinding refers to us, the researchers, not telling the subjects whether or not they're, the, they're in the experimental or they're in the control group. So they really shouldn't have expectations about how they're supposed to act. So we might say, you may or you may not be exposed to something, uh, whatever the IV is. This is likely to reduce demand characteristics, otherwise known as, question, go back if you need to, because it's an otherwise known as. And what about more control? Um, we can also double blind the subjects and the experimenters. So uh, the subjects don't know what group they're in, and the experimental assistants measuring the effect of the IV and the DV aren't sure which group of subjects they're talking with or they're talking to either. So they may be working with the experimental group or the control group. If they don't know, they're less likely to give away um, expectations. So think of the participant as being like a naive child. They love everything, but they're unaware of the true purpose of the experiment or what group they're in. So they're, it's kind of like naive and childlike. Um, this is likely to reduce demand characteristics and experimenter bias, so the experimenter isn't going to act differently towards the subjects. Counterbalancing, this is how we can kind of break down um, confounding variables. So we reduce order effects. So if you test some subjects from group A in the morning, because that's when the research room is available, you have to be, you can't test all of the uh, experimental groups in the morning and then all the control groups in the afternoon. So you split it up, you count, you balance it. Some of the control group in the morning, some of the experimental group in the morning, some in the afternoon, because that then cancels out the effects of early versus late testing. So time in this case then wouldn't be, an, uh, wouldn't be a factor, okay? Um, it limits the confound or test order or construction test order. So remember, um, experimental design is our most powerful weapon in research, um, but it's not that, it's not a catapult, it's not that kind of weapon either. Maybe it's, well, it's not that kind of weapon either. It is a weapon, um, our most powerful control weapon is random sample and random assignment. So we get a representative sample and we even out extraneous variables as they come in. So that's it, folks. Uh, rewind if you need to, and we will talk in class tomorrow. Thanks for hanging in there on this longer video. Nicely done, and we'll talk soon.